Hello, my name is Steve Sanka, and I'm an Emeritus Chaired Professor in Agricultural Strategy at the University of Illinois. I also serve as a Research Professor at the ADM Institute for the Prevention of Post-Harvest Loss. There I had a project team that's working on a year-long global learning assessment for the Rockefeller Foundation's Waste and Spoilage Development Initiative. The following discussion was prepared for the 2014 African Green Revolution Forum as part of a session focused on reducing post-harvest loss and food waste. These remarks are based upon our extensive study into what does and doesn't work to reduce post-harvest loss. I hope our learning will aid your understanding of the issues that must be addressed for sustainable prevention of post-harvest loss. Why is reduction of post-harvest loss important? Providing access to adequate, safe, and affordable food is clearly one of the great challenges of society. And even while today millions of the world's citizens do not have adequate access to food, the challenge for the future is even more daunting. Numerous studies indicate that the world's food system has to create the capacity to feed an additional 2 billion people over the next 20 years. Further, while the estimates are admittedly imprecise, there is evidence that something like one-third of the world's current agricultural production doesn't reach its intended final consumer. The concern that unacceptably high levels of post-harvest loss exist is particularly relevant within Africa. As examples, let's look at just a few available estimates of loss in Africa. These estimates are going to come from the Africa Post-Harvest Loss Information System, known by its acronym AFLIS. Stable food crops are the fundamental sources of energy and calories for the world's poor. And maize is one of the most widely grown of these staples, so let's look at maize in several countries. In Kenya, it's estimated that the average loss of maize in recent years exceeded 20%. In Tanzania and Senegal, maize losses are thought to average about 18% over the same time period. Teff is another important staple crop, particularly in Ethiopia. Post-harvest losses of teth in Ethiopia are estimated to average more than 12%. This means that for every eight kilos of teth produced, one kilo is not available for consumption. Fruits and vegetables, of course, have much greater levels of loss. The UN's Food and Agricultural Organization, the FAO, produced a definitive report on post-harvest loss recently. In that study, they reported that losses for fruits and vegetables in Africa averaged an astounding 49%. This means that for every two tomatoes produced, for every two bananas produced, for every two mangoes produced, on average, only one of those is available for consumption. Can smallholder farmers in Africa employ the technologies needed to reduce post-harvest loss? To respond to this important question, I want to draw upon some results from a very recent study conducted by the World Food Program. In this pilot effort, the World Food Program worked with 400 farmers in Uganda and Burkina Faso. The point of the exercise was to explore the extent of losses and the ability of smallholder farmers to adopt technologies which can reduce post-harvest loss. Now, I do want to emphasize that in addition to being provided technology, the farmers were provided education, training, and support. This slide shows the technologies employed in this test. The large picture is of a thatch granary that is representative of the traditional means for storage in these countries and in many other parts of Africa. Starting on the bottom left, we see the pictures of the five alternative technologies employed. There are small scale metal silos, plastic silos, the super grain bag, the zero fly bag, and the grain safe. The next two graphs describe the results of this pilot effort. The first three bars show how losses increase as the length of storage increases in traditional storage. 20% loss was recorded after 30 days of storage. However, these losses bloomed to nearly 60% after 90 days. In reality, few smallholder farmers are likely to store maize for 90 days or longer using traditional methods. They don't store for lengthy periods precisely because of those large losses. However, this means that smallholders are caught, caught in a sell-low, buy-high trap. 
commodities sold at or right after harvest receive a very low price. Those same commodities are much higher priced when farmers have to purchase them for family consumption at a later time. Now let's look at the results when these same farmers use the various alternative means of storage. The results are a dramatic reduction in loss across the range of alternatives employed. Indeed, there was a 98% improvement in loss reduction across the alternatives. Of course, there's a lot of important detail about the efficiency of each of these alternatives and how they were employed, and, we, and unfortunately, we don't have time right now to dwell under those, into those uncertainties. But the general message is really very clear. Effective technologies exist, and they can be effectively employed by smallholder farmers in Africa. Have we seen widespread adoption of technologies to reduce post-harvest loss in developing countries? To do this, let's go to another part of the world, in particular Central America. In Central America, indigenous farmers need to store maize as well. In the 1980s, the Swiss Development Corporation undertook to establish the use of metal silos as a means to reduce post-harvest loss in Honduras initially and then to three other countries in the Central America region. Here we see a very traditional type of mage storage. I grew up in a small farm in Iowa in the Midwest United States. We call this traditional storage a corn crib, and when we used it, losses on the home farm were significant. Of course, over the last 50 years, we've replaced that technology in Iowa with more effective ways to reduce post-harvest loss. The picture on the right shows a type of metal silo introduced by the Swiss Development Corporation in Central America. These are designed to fit the needs of one or a few families and to be located in or very near the household. During the year, grain is removed from a spigot at the bottom of the silo. Now let's look at the extent of adoption of metal silos in Central America. This relatively busy graph shows the rate of adoption throughout this development effort. The top line, the blue line, depicts the annual adoption of silos in total across the four countries, El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua. Each country's annual adoption is shown by the other colored lines. Again, there's a strong message in this chart that widespread adoption of loss-reducing technologies can occur. The continued adoption of metal silos in recent years is especially noteworthy. The direct financial support of the Swiss Development Corporation ended in the year 2003. Yet adoption continued and even increased in some countries after 2003. The most recent statistics indicate that over 600,000 metal silos are being used to reduce post-harvest loss in these four countries. The story of metal silo adoption in Central America is quite interesting. As, as with most technologies, it's about a long learning curve, some missteps, and some luck. Early on, the test of the effectiveness of metal silos was really quite similar to what we just saw for Africa. Yes, indeed, post-harvest loss could be reduced through the effective use of metal silos. The Swiss Development Corporation then discovered there was one supplier for metal silos in the Central America region. To increase competition and to foster more production of metal silos, the Swiss undertook to train artisans in the local villages to become tinsmiths. These tinsmiths did more than just manufacture metal silos. They took responsibility for distribution, for delivery, for support after sales to the smallholder farmers adopting this technology. Of course, there's no single one factor that explained all of the success. But our Swiss colleagues emphasize it's the tinsmith. The tinsmith is the engine of success for the metal silo experience in Central America. In this graphic, we depict two supply chains. One is a supply chain focused on the agricultural commodity itself as it moves from the farm to the consumer. This is the horizontal chain in the graph. This chain is a source of demand for any technology to reduce loss. The second vertical chain is a supply chain for the post-harvest loss reduction technology, in this case metal silos. If technologies to reduce PHL are to be adopted at scale, both supply chains are critically important. Unfortunately, in our development efforts to date, there's been a tendency not to pay enough attention to this vertical supply chain. 
In the Central America case, it is important to emphasize that the tinsmiths did more than just produce silos. They also provided the key supporting activities, distribution, delivery, and support, necessary for an effective market to emerge and grow. What are the takeaways from these examples? I believe there are three key lessons that have been demonstrated in examples that we've just looked at. These lessons are replicated across the numerous case studies that we have been investigating. The first lesson is that appropriate technologies do exist. And smallholder farmers can employ these technologies, and when they do, they significantly reduce post-harvest loss. And this is true for fruits and vegetables as well as for grains. Of course, improvements to technology are always beneficial, but we shouldn't feel that we have to wait for these improvements to initiate action that will benefit smallholders and society. The second lesson relates to scale. Use of such technologies can occur at widespread levels of adoption, and that adoption can continue even after external support is reduced or eliminated. The third lesson really focuses on that phenomenon of significant levels of adoption. Where such adoption occurs is because effective demand for the technology is matched by an appropriate supply of the technology. This linkage, that demand is aligned with supply, is almost by definition true. The interesting issue is what leads to the development of the conditions where effective supply and demand are matched. Let's focus on two conditions that seem to be consistently present when successful adoption occurs. The first relates to incentives, particularly economic incentives. It has to be in the best interest of farmers to use their resources to adopt the technology. And it has to be in the best interest of economic agents to supply those technologies. The second condition is somewhat less visible. However, consistently we see that widespread adoption occurs within a surrounding information ecosystem, an ecosystem that supports the direct buyers and sellers of the technology. Conversely, absence of this broader information ecosystem often forestalls the widespread use of technologies which, if adopted, could materially reduce post-harvest loss. At the beginning of these remarks, I emphasize it's important to all of us to see post-harvest loss reduced if we are to achieve the food security goals of the future that we all have an interest in achieving. Indeed, there are significant needs and really exciting opportunities associated with post-harvest loss reduction in Africa. Mm -hmm. However, we can't lose sight of the very fundamental need that smallholder farmers and other decision makers in the rural Africa settings have to see and experience direct benefits from the use of their resources to adopt technologies to reduce post-harvest loss. Further, all of us, whether we are in the public sector or the private sector or in civil society, need to appreciate the key role that we can play in fostering and maintaining the vibrant support system that will facilitate decision-making and adoption of post-harvest loss reducing technologies.